you just a little bit about our organization and then uh, also Audubon Rockies, who is a very valuable partner. And then we're gonna jump into some plant and some bird stuff. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. I know that with it being a weeknight, there's a lot going on. So we really appreciate you taking some minutes out of your day and being here with us. Our mission at Denver Audubon is inspiring actions that protect birds, other wildlife, and their habitats through education, conservation, and research. So inspiring actions is really that big piece that we are going to focus on tonight. Um, this is a really wonderful way that you can make positive actions in your own household and your own community for a lot of our local bird species. And we have been connecting people with nature for over 53 years. So Denver Audubon was founded in 1969. Um, and one of the original founders who is still actually a volunteer of ours as well is a resident of Douglas County. Um, he and his wife are over in Franktown. And then I myself as well, am also a resident of Douglas County up in Parker. So um, we have been around a long time in the Denver metro area doing some of the incredible work that we do. And I wanted to just kind of explain the difference between National Audubon, Audubon Rockies and us, because there's a lot of questions about that. So National Audubon is a huge organization that spans multiple states. Audubon Rockies is the regional office of National Audubon located here in Fort Collins. And then Denver Audubon is what we call an independent chapter. So we are actually fully kind of financially separate from National Audubon. We fundraise all of our own money here and we are able to continue the work that we do from local grants like the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District as well as private donations from individuals like you. So some of the different programs that we offer, just to throw it out there, because we have a lot that we're doing this spring and summer, we have a ton of free local birding field trips that people can register for. And we also have workshops and school programs that we do, as well as adult trainings. So we have a, a very popular community naturalist training program um, that I, I coordinate. So we have a lot of classes coming up for those. Um, and then we also have a non game wildlife research grant that we use to help support a lot of research going on in the state for animals that aren't hunted or uh, fish that are fished. So a lot of different opportunities there. And then we do community outreach presentations like the one that you're participating in this evening. And then we're also inspired by over 130 volunteers. So we would not be where we would be without them. I am one of three full-time staff members. Um, and then we have uh, one part-time staff member right now as well. So we would not be able to do the work that we do without all of these incredible people that kind of help us get our mission out into the community. So if you want to join us as a local supporter, we would absolutely love to have you involved with us. And then I also manage the Audubon Nature Center and the Native Plant Gardens at Chatfield State Park. And if you've never been down to our location before, it's a beautiful little gem located in kind of the southwest metro part of Denver. So if you have been to Chatfield State Park, most people get kind of trapped in, if you will, trapped um, going to the lake for lots of recreational activities and that can be very busy and very crowded. So we are shh, a little bit of a well-kept secret. If you just go a little further down Wadsworth, we are at the very Southern tip of Chatfield State Park near Waterton Canyon. Um, and our trails are always open as well as our demonstration gardens. So since we are a part of the state park system, uh, same rules apply as kind of visiting your state park. You can kind of come to us anytime you want to you seven days a week um, and we just have a rule for no overnight camping in our in our part of the park so we are going to talk a little bit tonight about our backyards um, but also how our backyards fit into the larger landscape and how as a county, you know, Douglas County and Douglas Land Conservancy really have an amazing opportunity to be able to help support local birds and local pollinators through the use of native plants. 
And so when we think about our backyards kind of specifically, there's that lens that we can look at it from, but then you also want to take a step back and look at the larger piece. What, what do your neighbors have in their yards? What does the city or the county you're living in use for plants? And then also on top of that, what is happening across the Western United States? So when we think first about this, we're going to kind of examine this and sort of take ourselves out a little bit from it and think about flyways. So when we talk about flyways, these are the kind of main four flyways that exist in North America. And these are the areas that birds use to help move from one place to another. And so you do have birds that interestingly enough actually will use two different flyways during their migration journey. And then we have birds that are constantly residing within a flyway. So we have a lot of birds that are here now right now in Colorado that have not left the state, but we're getting ready since spring migration is on its way to see a huge influx of birds into our state that are either stopping here to rest and refuel before continuing on their migration journey, or they're coming here to nest and have babies. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that later. So the central flyway, which is where we are located, comprises more than half of the landmass of the continental United States before it extends down into Central and South America. So it's a huge flyway. It is the largest flyway by definition. And if you look at the picture behind you, this is what that flyway used to look like. In most of Colorado, you had this really kind of open prairie um, area and kind of nestled in with some of the foothills and then obviously also moving up into the mountains. But over 40% of our state is, is prairie or was prairie. Um, and now what's happening is we're seeing that change. We're seeing that sort of morph and uh, develop into a more urbanized kind of habitat. And what has been happening in North America, which is the sad part, so we'll start with that first and then end with the things we can do, is that we have actually lost about 2.9 billion birds in North America since 1970. And so the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, which is another partner of ours, um, and then also an organization called Birds Canada, partnered to look at all of the different bird counts that had taken place over the last 50 years. And they used some very complex um, data computation with some big fancy computers. And when they looked at bird diversity within our continent, they found that we've lost approximately 3 billion birds. So it's not uh, your imagination if when you were growing up, you felt like there were more birds around, that you saw more birds and, and you experienced more birds. We have actually lost quite a number of individual birds as well as bird diversity across our continent. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology came up with some seven simple actions to help birds. And so when we think about our mission as Denver Audubon, we want to really focus and hone in on what are some of these actions that you and I can take to be able to help bring the birds back. And so tonight we're going to be focusing on this checkmark box of less lawn and plant natives. Um, and we have other presentations we do on all of these other uh, living bird friendly actions, but tonight we're going to focus on planting natives. So we want to first make sure that we all know and understand what we're talking about when we're talking about native plants. So I am a native plant master through CSU. Um, that's a certification that I received last summer. And you can actually do that as well. Anyone in our community can be a certified native plant master. And so um, I was someone who hadn't really thought a lot about this when I first got my start in biology because I was actually focusing more on some of our other global ecosystems. I, li I had lived in Australia. I had worked for the Denver Zoo here in Denver and then also a different zoo in Washington state. So I was really looking at global ecosystems when I got started in my career. And this was a definition that I had to reteach myself um, you know, when I started back with Denver Audubon and really started looking again at some of our local ecosystems. So a native plant is a species that occurs naturally in a particular region, state, ecosystem, and habitat without direct or indirect human actions. So these are the plants that have been here 
in Colorado for thousands and in some cases millions of years because we do still have a few really incredible plants um, that were here when the dinosaurs were roaming Colorado, which is incredible to think. So this is something where when we talk about native plants, we're talking about either plants that are native to North America, or in this presentation, I'm really focusing on plants that are native to Colorado, native to our state, because that's where we live. And you can actually digest that down even more, because if you think about what were the native plants that existed where my house stands right now, what would that have looked like? A hundred years ago. So that's kind of when I'm thinking about native plants, that's the framework that I use. So there's a lot of great cases for why native plants matter and why I hope that everyone at the end of this night is inspired to give native plants a chance um, and to try it out. So native plants provide complete nutrition, both macro and micronutrients for birds. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And also native plants support native insects. And we know now because of a lot of the research that's been done just in the last 10 to 20 years, that native insects are a key ingredient in the majority of terrestrial bird diets. And we're gonna break down that, some of that in numbers a little bit later as well. So they're also resistant to that Colorado weather whiplash that we experience here along the Front Range. Uh, this is a picture taken from my front yard uh, where I installed a lot of different native plants. And this is a Western spider wart that two years ago had already bloomed, was already beautiful, was already a foot and a half up, up uh, out of the dirt. And of course we had a late season snow and frost in May and my Western spider warts took it like champions that it, it didn't kill them off. Um, they just soaked up the snow, loved it. And they were looking bright and beautiful still just a couple of days later. These are also fairly low maintenance plants for the most part. A lot of natives, when you put them in the ground, you don't have to really to attend to them as much as you would some of the other uh, species that are carried in our nurseries. And then also many of them are drought tolerant. Now, of course, we've got some plants that are gonna require more water um, given you know, where they're found naturally occurring. But a lot of the plants available for home landscaping at this point are pretty drought tolerant. And then they're also really beautiful and interesting. There's so many different types of them out there. We have over 3000 plants here in Colorado that are native. So now we're gonna jump into what birds eat. Uh, this is kind of the big picture of what all birds eat. And now we're gonna kind of hone in on some of these more specific categories, but birds eat seeds and nuts. They drink nectar, they eat insects, they consume berries. Uh, some of them eat meat and some of them feast on carrion, on, on dead animals and, and other dead uh, plant material. So we are going to talk about some of these benefits that native plants can give us in the form of some of these categories. So we'll start with seeds, because when I ask, especially kids, and honestly, a lot of adults too, when I ask, what do birds eat? The very first answer I get is, oh, they eat bird seed. Yes, that is true. Um, but a lot of them will eat bird seed only for a specific time of the year. And that is usually in the winter. Um, but there are a few species out there that feed on seed almost exclusively, but it's very, very few. A lot of them switch their diet and they're not exclusively seed eaters. So this is a great example of a common seed eating bird that most people know. This is our house, house finch. If you put up a bird feeder, an artificial bird feeder, this is usually the first bird that's going to come around and find it. Um, but some of our plants that really do a wonderful service to us as far as providing native sources of seed include things like a uh, common sunflower. We have a lot of different sunflower species that are native to Colorado. You do have to be mindful if you go to a garden center what the scientific name is of that plant. So in this case, you've got Helianthus anus, um, but there are a lot of plants that are carried in our our garden centers or carried in big box stores that are not native to even North America. And so when you look at the scientific name, they might be related to some of the plants we have here in North America, but they are not actually plants that are native to the continent. So as much as I don't love to use Latin uh, in the plate, in the 
case of plants, it's actually really important to start to kind of understand why these scientific names are critical because there are so many plants out there. So this is a great example of one of our most common birds, the black cap chickadee. These are birds that people see at their artificial feeders all the time, um, but they have a really kind of amazingly diverse diet. And so in the winter time, you're going to see them coming to your bird feeders. You're going to see them flitting about all of the seed heads that are left behind in the winter time. Um, but they are also going to be eating a lot of other things during other parts of the year. We also have our native grasses, and these are often overlooked as landscaping choices for homeowners, but a lot of our native grasses are really wonderful for being able to add different types of textures and layering into your landscape. Um, this is our state grass of Colorado, the blue grama, and it has these really cool little curly seed heads in the winter time. So if you just leave them and you don't cut them back and you let them just hang out uh, in the winter season, a lot of our sparrows will come and feed off of these specific native grass seeds. And then this is a really wonderful example of a shrub that has some dynamic seeds and some really beautiful shapes and textures and colors. So this is a patchy plume and um, it is more of a shrub. It's, it's not a perennial flower plant necessarily. So it gets to be around maybe two or three feet um, when it's at its mature height. And this is an American goldfinch. And the American goldfinch also is known for consuming seeds. But what's really amazing with some of these plants that have super feathery seeds is birds will use them to line their nests as well. So it has a dual purpose, not only as food, but also as helping to be able to build some of that um, nesting material for the next generation of birds. And then we've got our conifer trees as well, which are also often overlooked as seed sources. But a lot of our birds love to go in and eat the pine seeds that come with our pine cones. And some of our native conifer trees like ponderosa pine, Colorado blue spruce, and our white pines. So they're really wonderful choices. So just a, a couple of examples of who are our seed eating birds. Um, and then I have these for each one of our sections tonight. So if you are just starting out on your bird ID journey, you are welcome to kind of follow along with us and take a look at some of these birds and see if you know who they might be already. Um, or maybe some of these birds are going to be new to you. Maybe you've just moved here and uh, these might be some new birds that you can learn to enjoy that could come and hang out with you in your backyard and around your property if you put in some of these native plants. So this is a nuthatch. This is our smallest nuthatch species. And then we're also going to uh, show some of our other nuthatch species as well. So nuthatches are known, hence the name nuthatch, for being able to crack open a lot of those seeds and those nuts. Um, they have that kind of nice strong beak. And the, we have three species of nuthatches only in the state of Colorado. So we've got the pygmy, and then we have these two other dynamic species as well. They're often seen hanging upside down. They're one of the few birds that can actually do that, that we have living here in Colorado. So it's a very unique behavior for them. We have our white breasted nuthatch and then also our red breasted nuthatch. And so these birds will consume seed sources uh, all through the winter. And then a lot of our sparrows also love to eat seeds the majority of the year. This is a type of sparrow that often people don't realize is a sparrow because it doesn't look like the rest of our sparrows. It's not brown and stripy, but this is a bird called the dark-eyed junco. And we actually have four different types of juncos that kind of frequent the front range that have different color morphs. So they're all the same bird genetically, but their colors express themselves differently. Um, so this is a dark-eyed junco, um, but there's a few different varieties of them that we have here along the front range. And then this is kind of more traditional what people think of when they think of our sparrows. This is a white crown sparrow, but this is an immature bird. Um, so it doesn't quite have the full white and black crown yet. Um, but this is another group of birds that really rely heavily on those seeds. Now, this sweet thing with its pink feet, this is our native species of dove. This is our mourning dove. And this is one of the only birds we have along the front range, the morning dove, the Eurasian collar dove, and also our rock pigeons that will consume seeds as 99% of their diet throughout the entire year. So when we're talking about seed eaters, true seed eaters, 
this, this is it. This is the poster child is, is these doves and these pigeons, but all the other birds that I just showed you, the chickadees, the nut hatches, the sparrows, they all switch their diet with the season to feed on other things. So when we're talking about seeds in particular, I wanted to just kind of highlight this because this is a topic that's been entering the conversation a lot with bird conservation is neonicotinoids. Um, and so neonicotinoids are a common pesticide that's used to actually coat seeds in agricultural crops. Um, and there was a study done with white crown sparrows where they experienced weight loss within hours of consuming some of these seeds that had neonicotinoids on them. And they also lagged behind other migrating birds. Um, so it's very, this was a very recent study just within the last three years. Um, and so we certainly know that neonicotinoids, if used in certain crops on the seeds can actually, as the plant grows and matures, remain in that plant, that's part of why they use it is so that they don't have to spray pesticide. So it, it's a pesticide that grows with the plant, which has some benefits. Um, but we also now know that consuming those seeds can actually make birds very sick. Um, and neonicotinoids do persist in the environment as well. And so they can impact our local native bee and native butterfly populations too. So it's important just to kind of keep that in mind um, as you're looking at getting plants or getting seeds it's a good question to ask of the places where you're purchasing things from. The next category is berries. So if you really want to diversify a lot of the birds coming to your property, there's some great shrubs out there and trees that have really delicious berries for birds. And there's a lot of birds that specialize in eating berry material only. So if you actually put in a lot of our native shrubs and trees with berries, you're going to start to see the amount of bird diversity in your property really rise. So hawthorn berries, just as an example, a berry in and of itself provides a complete meal. So a berry is full of sugar and antioxidants, as we know, right, as humans, we consume these berries all the time. And then they also have the potential to eat an insect. So there might be an aphid stuck on, on that berry or some other type of insect that's going to be on that berry. And so that's going to provide extra protein for the bird as they're consuming it, as well as pollen grains that are full of fat, good fats. And so all of these things together are a much more complete diet than providing, say, hold bird seed at an artificial feeder. So some of our favorite berry producing shrubs, this one is incredible. This is golden currant. Um, and this was a photo I took out at our nature center. And what I love about the golden currant is they have these these berries that go through these kind of three different color phases. So you've got a really beautiful golden kind of yellow berry as well as a red and then into a deep purple. Um, and then they have a gorgeous yellow flower in the early spring. So this is actually one of our earliest blooming shrubs in Colorado, um, golden currant. And when our hummingbirds who have started showing up, we've started to get reports of some broadtail hummingbirds in the area. These are a lot of the shrubs that they're going for are things like golden currant and also our American wild plum that are starting to bloom right now because they are gonna bloom earlier than a lot of our perennial flowers. And then we also have three leaf sumac. Um, this is something also called lemonade bush. Um, so these berries are very, very tart berries. And it sometimes is also called fragrant sumac because the leaves itself have a very distinct odor. Um, I actually find it to be a lovely odor. Uh, some people don't care for it, but I actually love three leaf sumac. Uh, it's a really easy way for me to identify it in the field. I can pluck a little leaf off and take a good whiff. Um, and that helps commit that, it helps commit that smell to memory. Um, and that helps me to be able to identify it like no matter where I'm hiking. Um, so three leaf sumac is a great option as well. We also have choke cherry. A lot of people are familiar with choke cherry and this is more like a tree than it is a shrub. It can get to be quite tall and it also spreads by suckers. So with choke cherry, I usually don't recommend that people plant choke cherry on their property unless they have a lot of property to work with. If you're somebody that has an acre or even a half acre, um, this could be a good option for you. But I have a teeny tiny little shoebox of a yard, so I wouldn't necessarily put in choke cherry in my landscape. 
And then we also have Rocky Mountain Juniper. Now, oftentimes juniper berries are, they're referred to as berries, but botanically they're actually not berries. They're actually kind of more similar to pine cones, um, but, but they tend to be classified in with berries as well. So Rocky Mountain Juniper is a good, a good tree to plant and a lot of birds specifically will consume those little juniper berries. And then we also have our rose species. So a lot of birds will consume rose hips. And so this is our native species of rose. This is called woods rose. And it has beautiful little rose hips and these tiny little petite flowers. So not as dynamic as some of the English roses that people tend to adore and love. Um, however, we don't really have the climate suitable in Colorado to have a beautiful English rose garden without a ton of effort and a ton of water. So this is a good native alternative. And then when we're thinking about the case for native berries, so there's a great book uh, that I reference a little bit later, uh, a gentleman named Doug Tallamy uh, wrote a book called uh, Nature's Best Hope and also Bringing Nature Home. And so Doug Tallamy, what he did was he actually compiled a lot of the research from a lot of different scientists out there that he's worked with. Um, and this was the study that they did where they actually looked at the components of plants from Europe and Asia and looked at their berries. And what they found is that a lot of the berries that are on these plants that have been introduced through the garden trade have very little fat. So less than 1% of the whole berry is fat and the rest of it is just like sugary goodness. Now that's not to say that birds won't eat it. Of course, birds might enjoy eating those berries. The issue is it's not as healthy for them. So if I give my six-year-old the choice between a lovely delicious salad and a Snickers bar for dinner, he loves salad. He might actually take me up on the salad, but he might be more motivated to eat the Snickers bar if given a choice. And that's how birds sometimes operate as well. So ber berries from our native shrubs and plants in North America, such as poison ivy, believe it or not, a lot of birds eat poison ivy berries, Virginia creeper, et cetera. They have up to 50% fat by weight. And so when birds who are migrating need to put on a lot of fat to power their migration, they are going to get more exhausted if they're if they're consuming these berries from Eurasian plants, as opposed to eating berries from our natives. And then they also had another study where they noticed that migrating birds will linger in habitats longer that have lots of native berries to choose from. And they kind of travel more quickly and forage more quickly through areas that have less native berries. So some of our berry eating birds that you might attract to your property include this lovely little cousin of the American robin. So a lot of people know American robins. This is a relative of the American robin called the Townsend Solitaire. And they're kind of a gray bird, you know, very nondescript with their field marks, but they share that white eye ring as robins have as well. Um, and they are specialized in berries. And so what happens a lot of times is we don't necessarily have the right kind of berry in our neighborhoods, especially in super urban areas, to attract a towns in solitaire. They really love junipers. And so if there's not enough of a concentration of juniper, then we, we won't get towns and solitaires around. This is another beautiful, uh, very unique bird with dynamic field marks. I mean, a beautiful mohawk and a black mask, and they have lovely orange uh, on their wings. So this is a bird called the cedar waxwing. And this is an adult on the left. And then on the right, this is actually an immature bird that was feasting on some golden currant berries, doing exactly what we would expect it to do. Um, being able to, to take a lot of that berry product and consume it. And these are birds that oftentimes too, we just don't see a ton of in our neighborhoods, if at all, because they tend to be around rivers and creeks where a lot of these shrubs are kind of naturally growing. And then here we have our good old American robin. So American robins are not in our neighborhoods in the wintertime a lot because we don't, again, have the berry production that American robins need. So in the springtime, most people notice them eating earthworms out of their lawn or eating other types of insects. And in the wintertime, they switch to consuming berries. So an American robin is gonna be a bird who's usually never gonna to come to your bird feeder and eat any seed, but they will come if you have certain types of berries. In your yard and they will come if you provide water. 
This is another really uh, dynamic migrant that we have in Colorado. A lot of people have a goal of seeing this bird. It's one of our more colorful birds. This is a bird called the Lazuli bunting. Um, and so they have this gorgeous kind of teal turquoise color, and then they've got an orange chest as well. This is another shrub that's pictured below called a wax current. Um, and so this is a great shrub as well to put into your landscape. And lazuli buntings love their berry production. So it's a great photo to demonstrate why they'd be on top of that shrub. And then last but not least, I wanted to mention this little bird. This is a yellow rumped warbler. So you can see the yellow rump there on the right hand side. That's how they get their name. But a lot of warblers are known for eating insects, which we're going to talk about towards the end. But the yellow rumped warbler has a really fascinating sort of adaptation that they have developed. So unlike other warblers, they have more intense stomach acids and stomach juices that allow them to be able to digest berry material as opposed to just being able to dissect insects. And because of that really unique feature, they are one of the first warblers to show up in Colorado. And sometimes they've actually been spotted in Colorado as early as January on some of our birding field trips because because if they're in an area where there's some berry production, they're able to digest the berries, even though typically most warblers would prefer insects and wouldn't be showing up here until uh, late spring into early summer to start eating that insect material. So we're also going to talk about nectar. So nectar is a great food source for a lot of our pollinators, and that is a whole different presentation, pollinator diversity, uh, that I will not get into tonight. But um, the birds that are kind of most well known for consuming nectar are, of course, our hummingbirds, our little jewels of the sky, and people love their hummingbirds. And so being able to put in natural nectar sources is a great way to draw more hummingbirds into your backyard landscape. A lot of people do experience and witness hummingbirds fighting over artificial feeders, and that is a real thing. And they also sometimes have to compete with things like honeybees or yellow jackets that are also coming to their artificial feeder. So a good way to deal with that challenge is by actually incorporating more native nectar producing flowers in your landscape. And that decreases the competition for that concentrated uh, opportunity for nectar that an artificial feeder might bring. So this is bee balm. Uh, this is one of my favorite natives. I have this planted in my backyard right now. And bee balm is in the mint family. So it actually has a really wonderful fragrance. And it has just these really kind of gorgeous purple uh, sort of uh, firecracker looking type blossoms. There are a lot of cultivars of bee balm available on the market as well. So if you go to a garden center, a cultivar is going to be a type of native plant that's been cultivated over time. And the genetic Genetics have been changed a little bit to highlight certain features. So you might actually see cultivars of this plant that are kind of bright red or a little bit more pink. This is our native uh, species to Colorado that is found everywhere that is wild, um, but you can also get it in garden centers now too. So this is the true genetic uh, version of what would have typically been found here along the front range. And then this is a broadtail hummingbird, a male broadtail hummingbird going after that bee balm. And then scarlet gilia is another a beautiful option. And what's incredible about scarlet gilia is that hummingbirds, as you can see from that flower shape, are the only animals that can pollinate it. So the flowers have adapted and changed over time to really fit almost perfectly with the shape of a hummingbird beak. And so there's certain plants like this where they wouldn't really continue to be in existence and there wouldn't continue to have that genetic diversity if they didn't have birds like hummingbirds being able to come in and drink nectar and pollinate it. We also have our Rocky Mountain Columbine. So this uh, blue and white flower in the front, that is our uh, Rocky Mountain Columbine species that is found here in the front range. Behind in this photo are yellow and dark purple and white varieties. Those, some of those varieties are columbines found in other parts of the world. So again, you just gotta double check and be certain that you're getting the Colorado native variety that you want. 
And then this is another beautiful purple flower that's a late season bloomer. So this doesn't come out until usually end of July, early August. This is called Dotted Gay Feather. I also have this planted at my house because I love it. Um, and so it has these beautiful little purple spokes and the hummingbirds love to come to it as well. So besides just hummingbirds, they're really the only ones that utilize nectar. And then there's one other bird that I'm gonna highlight for you, but this is a calliope. So we saw black chinned hummingbird in one of the first slides, the broad tailed hummingbird. And then this is a calliope. So the black chinned and the broad tailed nest here. So the broad tailed hummingbirds are the ones we're starting to see right now. Black chinned hummingbirds tend to show up a little bit later in spring, but calliope hummingbirds birds and rufous hummingbirds do not show up here until July because they are actually coming back through on their way down to central Mexico after they've bred all the way up in Alaska and parts of northern Canada. So the calliope is one that you wouldn't see show up until midsummer. Um, and then this is an orange carpet hummingbird trumpet flower. So this is an example of a cultivar. So it's not a Colorado native technically, but it is native to Utah and Wyoming and Arizona. So a hummingbird that's been traveling all across the Western US is going to recognize a plant like this, even if it's not regionally native to our state, they are going to recognize it as a plant that they know and they're familiar with. And then here's our, our broad tail hummingbird again, just a little bit closer look at him um, with his gorgeous red gorget there under his beak. And then this is a really incredible bird that actually also drinks nectar, but the way that they do it is very specialized. If you see that sharp, sharp beak, what they do is they actually pierce the base of the flower, and then they have a long sticky tongue that they use to kind of lap up the nectar that's at the base of the flower. And this is a Bullock's Oriole. So Bullock's Orioles are birds that weave nests and they hang them in a lot of cottonwood trees along our creeks and our rivers and our streams. Um, and so even though most of the year they actually consume insects, that's kind of the main, a main part of their diet, insects, as well as fruit, they're huge fruit eaters too, they have been observed piercing the base of flowers and drinking nectar. They're really, really incredible. So our very last section on, on food sources here is going to be insects. And I save insects for the last part of our of our presentation because insects are the most important they are the most crucial part of this whole presentation so seed is really important for some birds berries are really important for some birds nectar is really important for some birds but what we have discovered in recent years is that insects are actually the most important piece of this puzzle. So this is a beautiful mountain bluebird, uh, a male, and the mountain bluebirds are showing up here right now. Um, we've seen quite a few flocks of them. And there was a study done in 1999. So at this point, it's just over 20 years old, where they went through and they actually looked at what people had observed birds eating and feeding their young because there's more bird watchers out there than there are pretty much any other wildlife watchers in any other category. And so uh, Dickinson and some of his colleagues figured out that based on the reports that people had made and photos that had been submitted and all of the data that's out there on birds, 96% in other words, nearly all of our terrestrial birds in North America rely on insects and other arthropods like spiders to feed their young. So when we think about how we are going to help the future generations of baby birds so that we can bring back the birds and boost those populations in North America, we cannot have that conversation without talking about insects. And the majority of insects are beneficial to humans and to other, other wildlife and to the ecosystem for so many different reasons. But the other thing that was really fascinating when they started looking at what birds eat in the form of insects or arthropods, they found that Lepidoptera, 
which are butterflies and moths specifically, are the largest diet component of insectivorous birds in North America. So it's not just about, okay, let's save a bunch of insects, but we're going to save, you know, beetles or we're going to save wasps. They all deserve to be supported. Um, but what we found out is that these native Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, are the ones that insect eating birds rely on the most. And why this matters now as we start to understand the ecological circle of life is because if you've ever heard of monarchs and milkweed, native plants support 30 times more caterpillars than non-native plants. And the way that they figured this out was Doug Tallamy actually had some graduate students and Dr. Ashley Kennedy is one of them. And they vacuumed plants. They actually vacuumed non-native trees. So trees introduced from Europe and Asia and they vacuumed native North American trees. And the amount of diversity that they found on the American native trees of caterpillars was 35 times more than that of the non-native species. So what we put in the ground, in and around our homes, our businesses, our schools, really does dictate what the local insect population is doing. And that then dictates what our local birds are being able to feed on. So Dr. Ashley Kennedy, as a part of sign of the subset of research, she did a project called What Do Birds Eat? And it was a community science project where she asked people on Facebook and through a website to email pictures that they had of what birds were eating. And then she and her research associates also set up some cameras um, around the University of Delaware uh, to see what these birds actually were eating and get the photographic evidence. And it turns out incredibly that chickadees, which of course, when we think about chickadees, everyone's like, oh, they come to your bird feeder, they're seed eaters. 77% of the photos of chickadees submitted showed them eating caterpillars. Sparrows, another bird that we often associate with feeding on the ground and eating grass seed and eating other types of seeds from flowers. 65% of them were submitted with photographic evidence of having caterpillars in their mouths. And then the list goes down from here. And they did this for a lot of different types of insects, but what they found was that caterpillars first and foremost were the top choice for parent birds when it came to what they were catching, eating and feeding their young during nesting season. So then that begs the question of what do host plants for our local butterflies and our local moths in Colorado look like? And the short answer is lots of different things. Most people are familiar with monarchs and milkweed, but monarchs are just one small group of butterfly. Um, and we have over 250 species of butterfly in Colorado and over a thousand different species of moths. Moths are very understudied. So we actually don't even know the true diversity of moths in our state because of the lack of research. Um, but anything from our native trees to our native grasses, to our native perennials, to our native shrubs, Everything that we've already talked about today are all host plants for our native Lepidoptera, our butterflies and our moths. One of the other plants I think often though that kind of goes unrecognized for its contribution for pollinators is willows. So willows are actually a huge source of host plants for things like our tiger swallowtail and our western two-tailed tiger swallowtail. Um, and so willows are really critical family of plant that we have in our state that supports our native Lepidoptera. And we wouldn't necessarily want to go and have willows growing in our yard, probably. They really like water. They're going to be found in those riparian areas with creeks and ponds. But why I like to throw this in here is because it's really critical then that we also protect these areas, places like our state parks, places like Douglas Land Conservancy, the parks and the open spaces and the ranches that they purchase or that they get through conservation easements. It's really critical that we protect these places because they have a lot of these uh, plants that are host plants for Lepidoptera that we would never even really consider putting in our, in our landscapes at our homes. 
So we need to kind of look at one side of it as well, what can we put in in our homes and our landscapes there, but also how can we protect the, the natural habitat that's out there too? It's, it's twofold. So we, I did mention milkweed, but I wanted to also highlight one of the milkweed species that's kind of not as well known. Um, so this is butterfly milkweed, and it's kind of just now coming into the gardening trade. And it's not really native so much in too many counties in Colorado. So you wouldn't normally wander around an area and be able to see butterfly milkweed kind of growing. Um, but there's a few counties within the state of Colorado where it is considered to be a native. But this is something where you could put it in in your garden at your home and be able to support monarchs, but also some of the other butterflies that will host on milkweed like queen butterflies and viceroys. And then cherries are also a huge family for being able to support Lepidoptera. So we talked about choke cherry before. So I wanted to also just throw in there our sand cherry. Cherries are, are huge for a lot of the butterflies and moths to host upon, just cherries in general all over North America. And so most specifically in our state, we've got things like our sand cherry and our choke cherry. So again, what birds are eating? Insects, 96% of our terrestrial birds are consuming insects during the nesting season. So that's going to be starting right now in April, going all the way through September or early October. That is when our birds are nesting. So some of these birds that are very specifically relying on insects where they eat insects most of the time are going to be birds that are migrating to the state now. So the reason why they can't be here with us in the wintertime is because the majority of their diet is insects and we don't have the insects here in the winter with the snow and the cold and the rain and the wind uh, to support them. So a Sase Phoebe is one of the earliest spring arrivers. So this is a spring migrant that is here right now. I heard one in Highlands Ranch about a week and a half ago. And they predominantly feed on insects. They're a type of flycatcher. And then we also have another warbler. So this is our yellow warbler with a cute little caterpillar right there in its mouth. Um, and so this is another one of those later season migrating warblers that's gonna show up here in the next probably month or so. And this is another really awesome bluebird. It's not a bluebird, but it's a bird called a blue gross beak. So it's in a different family. It's actually related to our cardinals. So for people who love cardinals, this is the Western equivalent to the cardinals cousin. Um, we have a handful of cardinals that show up here in Colorado, but not very often. Instead, maybe you can fall in love with the blue gross beak and uh, you can go out searching for the blue gross beak around during the spring. And then we also have our swallows. So swallows, they consume a lot of those insects that people consider to be pests or not as favorable. I try not to use the word pest for for any insect, because um, I think all of them are valuable. But barn swallows consume things like mosquitoes, a lot of our moths, they can catch insects on the wing. Um, and so a lot of those aquatic insects like mayflies or crane flies or midges, those are all types of insects that these barn swallows are gonna be eating. And yes, even hummingbirds, eat insects as well. So we did talk about them consuming nectar, but anywhere from 30 to 80% of their diet can also be insect material. And this is a great picture from a gentleman uh, actually right here in Parker. And he had posted this photo on Facebook. And I said, can I please have that photo for my, my native plants uh, for birds presentation? Because it shows so wonderfully a broadtail hummingbird going after a midge. And so a lot of our hummingbirds will consume insect material in addition to their nectar. So it's very important. And then last but not least, resources. So where can I find these plant lists? You have convinced me, Kate, I want to rip out all of my landscaping and put in natives. Um, and that's what I did at my own house. So I can certainly attest to uh, the success that I have had with doing a project like that and actually doing it on my own. It was a lot of trial and error, but you can find plant lists in a few different places. So Audubon Rockies 
um, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, CSU Extension. So that's who I did my Native Plant Master class through. They have a lot of native landscaping worksheets that have been created by one of our volunteers, actually. So she was the creator of the Native Plant Master program, and she worked for CSU for many years. She's also an Audubon Master Birder because she went through our Master Birder training uh, a few years ago. And she's now retired. Um, she doesn't work for CSU anymore, but she developed a lot of those sheets. And then also we, Denver Audubon, we have some resources on our website. Um, so we have a great handout that's just native plants for birds that goes through a lot of the things that we just talked about. And then also low water native plants for Colorado gardens. Um, the Colorado Native Plant Society has this guide for the front, head, front range and foothills. But what I love is they've actually done the entire state of Colorado. So if you have a mountain cabin, up above 8,500 feet, they have a native plant guide for that. If you live out in Elizabeth, they've got a native uh, plant guide for prairie as well. Um, so lots of great options there. And then we also want to just think about if we're going to put in those native plants, the native plants are our building blocks. The, the native plants and the plant choices are the building blocks for the ecosystem that you are going to create. And so just kind of some icing on the cake to those are things like water resources and being able to create layers and, and be able to understand that some birds like to feed from the top of plants, other birds like to feed on the ground and be more hidden. So layering is really important. Leaving your leaf litter all winter long, collecting your native leaves and, and putting them in your garden beds and leaving them there as opposed to throwing them away. Um, or you can compost them, but leaf litter is really valuable, as well as things like snags and logs. Um, and then also plant stems. This has been a hot topic of late because a lot of people have been saying, well, can't I start cutting back my dead plant stems? Or maybe you already have. And a lot of our native bees um, that we have in Colorado, we've got 946 species of native bee in our state. A lot of them will use plant stems to lay their eggs in. So we're talking one female bee going to something like a bee balm stem, which is what I have pictured here, and they will actually drill a little hole in that plant stem and lay an egg, and then they'll give that egg the pollen and the nectar that it needs to kind of grow and develop, and then that new baby bee emerges in the spring. Um, and usually a lot of our native bees are not going to be emerging and coming out for another month or so. So when people start to clean up things in March, there could be a lot of baby bees and other insects that you're disturbing. So we really like to encourage people to leave that stuff until um, the latter part of April, early part of May. And then also birdhouses. Birdhouses are great. There's only a few birds out there that will use birdhouses as opposed to kind of the bigger general diversity of birds in Colorado. So that's certainly one thing you can do, but it's it's not the end all and the be all. And then just, I wanted to also share about certification and invite you again to come out to the Audubon Nature Center and just walk around our demonstration gardens. That's why they are there. We want you to use them. We want you to have that as a resource for you and it's free. We are a gold certified Habitat Hero Garden through Audubon Rockies. And so when I took over the gardens about seven years ago, I went through a lot of different certification processes. So Audubon Rockies was one of the first um, certifications that we received from our partners up there. And it's pretty easy. You just have to start planting um, and then use some of those resources. And a lot of the certifications, there is an application payment that you pay. You know, it's like $30 usually or 25. And that's so that you can get the sign, right? If you are gonna put the sign up in your yard and let people know what you're doing. Um, and then also the Native Plant Society has their own certification, and that's a new certification that they just came out with two years ago. So we are also a gold certified uh, native plant garden through Native Plant Society. And then National Wildlife Federation as well um, has their certification, and we have that too. So I'm just going to conclude with this quote, and then we'll get to the questions. 
So it is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing, and that's to make a difference. And in this case, the difference will be to the future of biodiversity, to the native plants and animals of North America and the ecosystems that sustain them. And so what I love about this quote is that it's it's so true that you can go tomorrow and go pick out a couple native plants, put them in your landscape and the next, you know, month to month and a half. I wouldn't plant them quite yet because we might still get a couple deep freezes, but you can use this time to research and really start to find some dynamic native plants that speak to you that you might want to try to just have in your landscape. So with that, Thank you so much for listening. Um, I know we've got some questions in the chat, so we'll we'll address those. Fantastic. Hang on, let me um, make myself visible as well. Yeah, sure. Somehow, just a second. That's okay. okay. I can I can see that. Yeah. Question. Okay. Let's do that. Let's do that. That'd be best. Okay. Yeah. So I loved that, Kate. Let me just say, I love that. I can't believe we haven't offered this um, before. I mean, it brings in everything that uh, the Douglas Land Conservancy community loves. We love being outside, digging in the dirt. We love the land. We love protecting the creatures. And this just brings it all together. Plus, it's really fun to start talking about our gardens right now, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, um, people. a lot of people are saying thank you and, and dropping off. Um, I'm going to follow up with those resources. Um, I'll either grab your slide or just type the, um, type the websites for everybody. And uh, I do want to thank everybody for coming. And if you're going to hop off, I just want to say that I hope to see you at other DLC events, um, hikes out in the land or something online like this, uh, this season. And, and we're doing, are, we're doing pollinators together, aren't we, Amy? We are, <laughs> we are during, what is that, during pollinator week, which is June what? Uh, mid -June? Uh, yeah, it's like the third week in June. I'm okay. doing summer camp that same week too, but it's around like the 19th of June. Yes, we're going to do that. And then I think also um, you are a part of our Animals Around the Rock series, what we do with the town of Castle Rock, and you're going to present on bats. So I yes, think that's I am. this summer as well. So other opportunities to see Kate and learn from her. Uh, and so let's get to the questions. Let's see. Hey, my friend Kate uh, Lisa Sorbo would like to know, when do hummingbirds start to return? Yeah, so the answer is now. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. So there was a there was one of our um, community supporters out in Roxboro. She had a broadtail hummingbird that she saw just within the last week. So um, it's actually a tiny bit early, but but mm -hmm. not too much. Usually, beginning of April is when the male broadtails start to return. They're the first ones that we see, and then the females kind of start to follow suit a couple weeks later. And then the black chinned hummingbirds will start to show up um, at the end of of April or early mid to May. Okay, and then the other varieties a little later in summer or in July. Yes. All yeah. right. Um, another question, would it be okay if my dogs consumed the berry from some of those bushes? Yeah, that's a great question, Lisa. So it depends on the shrub. So if you have a dog, then it's really important to make sure that you just kind of research the plant and the shrubs you're putting in. Um, I will say like something like choke cherry, a lot of coyotes consume choke cherry and uh, they seem to do just fine with that. A lot of bears also consume choke cherry, mm -hmm. but choke cherry, the common name, the reason why it's choke cherry is because they're very tart. Um, but if you eat too many of the pits, like especially humans, we're not supposed to consume the pits of choke cherry. You're supposed to spit those out um, because they can be slightly toxic. So it is important if you do have dogs that like to eat and experiment with things um, mm -hmm. or small children, uh, it's good to research the toxicity of plants, but a lot of these native plants that are, are kind of recommended for landscaping, there's very few of them that are toxic. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. What do you recommend to use for aphids and or white mossy mildew that would still be safe for birds? Yeah, so what I do with aphids is I actually spray them off of my plants using a high-powered hose attachment. 
Um, so there's a lot of chemical out there, obviously, for treating for treating insects on plants. Um, but there's also a lot of birds that consume aphids and a lot of other larger insects that consume aphids. And so it is, in my opinion, as a wildlife biologist and ecologist, it's just kind of a part of the life cycle. And mm -hmm. I have had aphids on both of my milkweed plants. I have both uh, swamp milkweed and I have butterfly milkweed in my backyard. And I've had aphids on them the last two years. And so far it has not decimated the plant to the point of no return. So I usually go out there and I just spray them, you know, like once or twice a week before the population gets kind of like really out of control. Um, but I don't, I don't use chemical on them because I'm, I'm an organic gardener. All right. Can you recommend a safe bird seed for my backyard feeders? Yeah, great question. Um, I can't recommend a safe bird seed specifically like, like any particular product. It's kind of the same as like the things that we eat as humans. There's so many things on the market right now. So the best thing you can do is educate yourself on what some of the, the kind of different bird brands are and bird seed brands. I do have a whole different presentation I do on backyard bird feeding because it is complicated. But typically, if you go to the specialty bird stores, of which there is like a Wild Birds Unlimited in Castle Rock. There's Front Range Birding Company over in Littleton. There's the Urban Bird in Denver. Um, and then there's also a couple other Wild Birds Unlimited stores in Highlands Ranch and um, Littleton as well. And I think one up in Arvada now. Those all tend to carry really high quality seed. If you go to a box store or you go to your local grocery store and buy seed mixes, it's they're very cheap, but there's a reason why is because the nutritional quality of that seed is usually not great. Um, if you want the biggest bang for your buck, black oil sunflower unhauled. So okay. that is just sunflower seeds uh, that are not open, not broken open um, and you can buy a 50 pound bag of that. And that is actually the favorite seed of most birds or you can plant sunflowers and just <laughs> their seed heads all year. Um, so yeah, that's a great one. All right, good. Uh, where is the best place to buy native plants? So Amy, I'm gonna send you a link to that mm -hmm. list um, because okay. it depends on what part of town you're in. Um, there's actually a lot of different places that sell natives right now, but it's not always like the garden center that's around the corner from you. Mm -hmm. So um, I can send you the list because that's, it changes a lot given the year. So yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. All right. And yeah. I'll pass that along. I'm going to yeah. follow up tomorrow uh, with everyone uh, with an email with all this. So I'll, as soon as I get that from you, then I'll share with everyone else. Okay, uh, sure. Couple more questions. Are there any landscapers that specialize in planting bird-friendly yards? Yes, there are some landscapers that do that. Um, there's a, a handful of them that we've worked with in Denver. Um, and actually Audubon Rockies on their Habitat Hero page, they have some recommendations as well since they're the ones that host the Habitat Hero program. So that's mm -hmm. a good recommendation. I apologize. My husband <laughs> and my kids just walked through the door. So we're, uh, we're a couple minutes over. You're There's good. They be, thought they could there come might home. be some traffic. There might be Hi, some everybody. Um, okay. Two, a couple more questions um, related to the bird flu virus. Um, are all the bird species susceptible to the bird, bird flu virus that's circulating? And how will we know when that is gone? That's a great question. Um, so I am not a virologist right now. Um, I did hear that we have had a couple of uh, positively confirmed cases of bird flu in Colorado. Um, the best place to really check for with that though, usually is like your local wildlife manager. Um, so Colorado Parks and Wildlife keeps tabs on that as well as APHIS, um, which is through the uh, the sorry, the United States Department of Agriculture, so USDA, the APHIS program, they mm -hmm. tend to be the ones that actually track that kind of thing. Um, and then we work with a lot of the bird rehabilitation uh, kind of nonprofits. So, you know, Greenwood Wildlife Rehab, um, they're up in 
kind of the lion's area, they're the ones that are receiving a lot of those birds and testing mm -hmm. birds and then sending those off to be kind of tracked in a lab. So um, they're usually the ones that alert us when something like that is taking place. And so right now it's actually been advised that if you see a dead bird in your area, not to pick it up or touch it, um, that you should let someone know, um, your local wildlife biologist, or you can call Greenwood Wildlife Rehab and report it to them. All right. That's the end of our questions. Um, Kate, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful. And I'll follow up with everyone else tomorrow. Yeah. Um, oh, and there I loved one. your advice. Let's there all was... give native plants a chance. <laughs> We all, um, you know, if we all do just a little bit, it makes a difference. Yeah. Well, and Linda, Linda had one more question too, just oh. that I, I caught here at the bottom. Are all it's native plants, are all native plants, plants perennials? And no, some of them are annuals. Um, but more of the plants that are native to Colorado are perennials because there's an ecological advantage to doing that. If you're a perennial, um, you've got deep roots. And so that really allows you to be able to withstand some of that weather whiplash that I was talking about. So there mm -hmm. are some sunflower species out there that we have that are native to Colorado that are annuals. Um, things like Rocky Mountain bee plant, which is a gorgeous plant. Um, sometimes it's not great for a home setting if you don't like plants that jump around and move around because Rocky Mountain bee plant will be in one location and then it's going to die off and the seeds are going to spread and move to a different place in the garden the next year. So it really depends on the plant, but a lot of our natives are perennials. All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.